fit in the way you say that, it sounds like maybe after the talk I won't have the job in Amazon <laughs> anymore. <laughs> For the moment, she's at AWS. Um, so how many folks this morning, um, how many of you like guinea pigs? Anybody? They're kind of cute. Okay. Andy does. Yep. Nick does. It's an IBM thing. Um, the reason I ask is because you're all going to be guinea pigs for this talk. Um, this is something that I've been throwing around with um, some of the folks in, uh, in my teams as well as some of our customers talking about um, it, many of these concepts for anyone who does any data science is not new. Um, it's the simplification of them for a broader audience. So I would love feedback on whether this makes any sense whatsoever and how and when to sort of introduce some of these concepts and frankly how practical and pragmatic the implementation of them is. So with that in mind, I have now taken all the work from my shoulders and put them onto your shoulders. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about dimensionality um, and IoT data and there are a couple of different um, ideas of what dimensionality means kind of depending on the, the data science or engineering focus that you have, if it's machine learning, if it's statistical models, um, or if you're in a BI engine. Um, but basically, the simplicity of it is that uh, attributes or variables within your system, so all of your different data sources, you think all those different sensors that are sitting in a car, um, that tends to be high dimensionality. You got a lot of information. It's got a lot of interacting parts versus something like a light bulb. It's not just simpler, but it also has less dimensions to its data. You can have states like on and off. You can have the temperature of it. You can have its current pull, but there's not a lot of direct measurements coming off of this device. So very simply, um, that's the basics of, of data dimensions. So why are they even something to be considered, aside from who doesn't like dimensions? Um, the Twilight Zone, I mean, they're some of the best sci-fi in the world comes out of dimensions. Um, but basically, the more dimensions that you have in a system, um, the more things fall over on you. So particularly when you're looking at analysis, you have, um, as, your as your dimensions expand, so does the space of analysis that you have to go into, kind of like a balloon. Um, and that means that your data gets sparser and sparser. So anything that requires a certain amount of data, data density, um, things that have statistical significance, those techniques, like machine learning, um, for the most part, like, frankly, most of statistics, they all kind of, of um, go away. It becomes harder and harder to be able to get to a st statistically significant solution to your problem. Um, now there's one way of solving that. We could add more and more data into the system, which you can do, and we at Amazon love it when you do because your EC2 bills go up. It takes more and more <laughs> compute to be able to make it through that data. Um, but basically, it, it makes it more expensive, more time consuming, and in many instances, um, impossible to run. So just as a sort of what expansion means, I don't know how many people here know the basic fundamentals of neural networks and machine learning. Oh, good. Um, then you know how high dimensionality sucks. Um, basically, the, there's an exponential curve uh, with the number of dimensions and the number of, of trainings that you've got to do in your system. So um, visually. Now, how does this relate at all to IoT? Um, yeah, I get a little kitschy. You should have known that with the TARDIS <laughs> on the front. Um, but supersymmetric thing <laughs> theory is what uh, I've been working on generally with the team. Um, not my name, by the way. It's silly. Um, but basically, you can classify by the complexity of data coming off of a system, IoT systems from zero dimensional to three-dimensional-ish. Um, I'll walk through what these basically are, but just for kind of mental model around this. If you've got a single device, and usually a single app, or maybe a couple of apps, but you basically have very simple devices, a discrete amount of information coming off of that. 
If you've got a process, that's a one-dimensional system, basically the inputs of one are the outputs of another, so on and so on. These tend to be homogeneous environments. Obviously, one device is homogeneous. Um, one-dimensional systems also tend to be homogeneous, just based on data relationships. Two-dimensional systems, where we start to get some heterogeneity, um, those tend to be centrally managed. And we'll go through a couple of examples. And then 3D is where it gets messy. That's frankly where a lot of the value in IoT is. That's where you've got multiple processes, all of which are being measured by different types of devices. Think oil refinery. Um, and you've got a lot of relationships to be managing and potentially a lot of information hidden um, within the data sources that are coming off of that. And we haven't even talked about the problems of time and dynamic changes in this structure. Now, the reason we've kind of thrown this up here is I use it as a way to talk about the different technologies that come with complexity in IoT. This, there are so many IoT platforms out there that can handle a device and an app. Heck, you don't even need an IoT platform. Um, One-dimensional systems, again, so much easier to manage both from a device provisioning and control plane standpoint as well as just from a data standpoint. Um, there are still lots of complexities that IoT brings into these, things like missing data, data that arrives out of sequence, heck, just timing as a service. I don't know why we don't have IoT um, time as a service. But as you go into a two-dimensional system and then again into a three-dimensional system, things like information models and semantic meaning come into it for it. You get more and more enrichment that's required to get information out of this because there's a whole ecosystem in which this is interacting with. So it's kind of an interesting way to look at additional technologies that come in as you get to the systems of system space. Zero dimensional systems, this one we all pretty well know. Um, many consumer devices hit this. Um, they tend to be simpler devices. There are robots out there that have multiple sensors, in which case they don't necessarily look like a one-dimensional system because they actually more, look more like a two-dimensional system where they've got um, a, a central hub that's collecting all of the sensor data on board and, and populating that. Um, things like shipping containers are a good example of something where you have GPS, you might have temperature, but basically these are discrete and controlled by that single device. Um, and you can tell interesting information like the flow of oil around the world from very simple devices. So you can get, you can get complex insight out of simple devices, um, but from a, uh, from a data dimensionality standpoint, they're easier to manage. Um, one dimensional systems, I've tried to come up with some examples that weren't flow. You know, flow through an oil pipeline, um, baggage along the track and thing, conveyor belts and fulfillment centers. Um, all of them seem to have a, um, a flow component to them. They are homogenous sensors, so something managing, you know, monitoring flow along that pipeline. But again, they have a very linear relationship between the data that's coming off those sources, which means that you can pretty much create a static relationship and that will continue to hold because the fundamental physical processes behind these are interrelated in a very simple fashion. Two-dimensional systems. Um, this is where we start getting um, excited. Uh, and that's basically because we have a central gateway where we are collecting lots of information. But there are linear relationships between all of these elements. They themselves may not have complex you know, relationships. I'm not expecting my light bulb and my home lock to be something that interact on a regular basis. However, in a control mechanism around if this, then that, you can create fairly simple, straightforward relationships and processes between them. Um, Three-dimensional systems, again, where things start to get interesting. That's an airport, by the way. Yeah, very fancy graphics. Um, but again, in an airport kind of situation, you've got, if you want it to, airlines make the majority of their money on how quickly they can turn around those flights at the ramp. So if you've got baggage, that's one thing that needs to get there. There are potentially three different companies between when you drop your bag off at the contractor who is taking your ticket 
down to the person, the baggage handling company that the airline deals with, which is managing it along all those conveyor belts, potentially TSA if you put something no-no in your bag or they think you did. Um, and then usually there's somebody within the airline themselves that's making sure that these bags get on at the actual plane. So you've got a whole bunch of people involved in just that one process. That, of course, needs to make sure, since it's regulation, that you and your bag are on the same flight, that people flow comes into this too. So you've got people flow through the airport as well as baggage flow, as well as the catering truck and pneumatic pumps that need to get refurbished each flight turnaround and got to clean out those toilets. And I mean, there's a lot of different processes, all of which have an interrelationship that needs to come together. In addition to a set of metadata, my bag, if I'm a frequent flyer with a high status, matters more than a bag of a traveler who doesn't. And so knowing what my status is and what my value as a customer is means they'll either delay the flight to get my bag on or they'll put it on the next one. I travel a lot, however, I don't seem to have enough status to get my bag 100% of the time. Um, <laughs> so I say that a little tongue in cheek. And then of course there are other areas where you're adding more dimensions to data. So I mentioned enrichment, everyone likes to use weather as the kind of you know, default what affects everything. Um, being American, the weather is really important these days. Um, but there's also um, sensor fusion information. So sensor fusion is basically when you have two data sets or two data sources and there's actually a greater amount of information in the combination of the two. I think of it like lime and papaya taste better together. Um, but basically, there are a bunch of filters and so forth that you can run through to be able to extract that data set that you can treat it as just another data store, i.e. be able to lose the two underpinning data, um, data sources in favor, of that, in favor of that third. But it's an expansion, again, of dimensions. So dimensions are bad. We've already talked about how they mess up your analysis. Um, it took me like 20 minutes to get that. <laughs> JPEG. Um, <laughs> it's maybe my favorite slide. Anyway, um, so there are a bunch of techniques that have been devised around how do you reduce dimensionality in data? How do you figure out information? Data is only important because it encodes information, right? I don't really care what the temperature of the room is unless um, it's too hot or too cold, in which case I want to be able to change it. So it's about the information that's encoded in that data store five doesn't mean anything until it's the temperature of my food. Um, so there are a couple of different ways to do this. Usually, and we'll talk about, I'll go, kind of go through quickly, because 20 minutes isn't a lot of time to go through all of the mathematical techniques on, on how to do um, dimensional reduction. However, um, there are a couple of physical ways to do this too. So sensorization. Um, which is really, you know, how many sensors do you put on something? What, what kind of a density of measurement do you have? Um, if you think about that ahead of time, you can do a couple of different things. Um, one is you don't stuff a bunch of sensors on there, all of which are measuring the exact same physical phenomenon, without having um, a use for that data. If that data is to correlate and make sure that one sensor, we've got a bunch of crap sensors, and what you really are looking for is the, you know, the coalescence of those sensors rather than one single measurement, fine. Um, but then use that coalescent data store instead of each individual one when you're looking at um, the reduction of dimensions. So um, we still have challenges when we talk to our customers in the hardware space about getting the embedded teams to talk to the hardware teams, to talk to the data scientists. That language variation is pretty high. Um, trying to tell somebody who's worried about battery life that they need to not give you an extra extraneous dimension to your data. Um, usually ends in kind of a head cock. Um, the other thing, and this is one of my favorite techniques, um, we're seeing this more and more, is rather than going and, and having sort of a bottoms up approach to data. So for instance, if I've got a refrigerator and I want to know is it working properly, I can go through and I can measure the temperature inside, I can measure um, the freon levels, I can measure um, the compressor, uh, energy plug, put all these things together and then kind of get a really comprehensive image. Or I can stick an energy clamp on the incoming power store and watch um, and create a profile for what looks like a healthy 
refrigerator and what looks like a refrigerator that needs to get replaced. Now, there's obviously um, a contextualization of putting an energy clamp on that is not going to answer all questions. You've got to know what the questions are that you need to answer. Um, but if you can look at and you can measure symptoms, I guess, rather than the actual underlying causes, and you can make decisions off of that, that also will reduce um, dimensions, which gives you a lot more flexibility in the type of analysis that you can do. Um, neural networks, getting onto the math side of the house, not only are they a problem for high dimensional data sets, they are also a solution, um, which is basically neural networks are used to optimize for those who don't um, use them on a regular basis. But basically, you can go through and look, and, and if you've got, you know, 560 variables, which uh, there was a recent hackathon where they gave 561 variables and told a bunch of data engineers and students to go ahead and, and um, tell them, you know, what the overall fitness level of, a, um, of one of the college students was. Um, if you had used a neural network, you could have removed uh, duplicate data structures. You can remove data sources that don't have high quality data. You've got a lot of missing data, set, uh, data points from a data set. You can get rid of that data set. So there's a whole set of, of kind of cascading techniques um, to, to pare down until you've got the minimum number of data dimensions in your data set in order to be able to arrive at a conclusion. So again, the minimum number, you want to keep the information levels high, and you want to reduce all the unnecessary data. So. Um, that's the tweak that you're constantly playing on. And that works with varying degrees of success depending on, um, uh, depending on how nice your data set is. And again, in IoT, it tends to be crap, um, as we heard from Yoda. So um, all of these problems get worse and worse um, as we add more and more background information into our IoT systems. So today, how many you know, things are really connected to the internet? Well, we talked about zero dimensional. So you got a lot of devices that have a, have a dial tone. We've got processes, usually industrial processes that are, that are measured um, in very limited uh, capacity. Um, and then we've got um, a lot of, sort of two dimensional environments, smart buildings. You've got a gateway and you've got a bunch of devices all that are collecting and simply managed. Um, but what happens when, you know, there are RFID stickers you can just slap onto the walls and it tells you, you know, how many people are really um, interested in how many people are falling apart, carbon dioxide levels. Um, you know, how many, uh, yeah, anyway, the data background of IoT is something that will continuously add data structures to this. Uh, also, it's changing. So what if something that today, you know, we talk about smart home as a two-dimensional structure, hub-spoke model. Well, the minute you start talking about ambient intelligence, you know, where you're starting to have much higher levels of, of integration within the devices and the data, you're asking different questions of the data, then it starts looking a lot more like a 3D problem. Um, where you've got multiple layers of processes and relationships amongst that processes. So um, I, would, I would push out there um, that, <laughs> one, we need more compute. Um, <laughs> so yeah, a little bit biased on that front. Um, but also we just need more and more systems to be able to understand because we haven't had a uh, efficient and cost-effective way to look at high dimensional data. We don't also have a lot of techniques to be able to look at high dimensional data. We have techniques to reduce the dimensions, um, but when you can no longer reduce to a dimension that you can run a neural network on, what do you do? Um, today, we don't solve those problems, and in the future, if we're truly going to have a connected world, we need to be able to solve those problems. So, oops, wrong direction. Speaking of wrong direction, um, basic takeaway simple data. You can do complex analytics on it. Complex data, simple analytics. So that's sort of general rule of thumb. Um, the more data dimension reduction that you can accomplish, the more complex an analytic structure you can run on that because you can handle the additional dimensions that's added by that structure. Oops. And <coughs> questions. 
assuming we still have time. I have no idea. Ah, I thought I had talked relatively fast. Not any questions? Any Hi, Ian. <laughs> So to reduce the complexity of the data, what, are there tools available, or can, how do people go about doing that? Yeah, so there, there, are, um, there, are, ser there are a series of, of data science tools. There are some things that you can do um, looking at your system rather than necessarily initially starting with the data, um, which is to say if you look at your system and you understand the fundamental physical properties, I'm a physicist, so that's where I usually start. Um, if you know that speed is a combination of, or momentum is a combination of speed and mass, um, and you're measuring speed, mass, and momentum, you know, momentum can be taken out of the data set. It's not providing more information. Um, so there are, there are, that's kind of a first pass. Um, once you're looking at the data set, there are a bunch of, of techniques. It really depends on the data, which is why I didn't go into all of the techniques. <laughs> um, but there are some really good uh, papers out there that will kind of walk through, and there are some, um, some techniques, and there's actually some great research on kind of comparing those um, different techniques across uh, data structures. But the easiest thing to do is to kind of identify, first and foremost, what's real crap data. Um, and then it's not going to be useful anyways, you know, so you can start there. But that's a simple thing. There are a set of tools. And actually, there are a set of pre-built neural network components to be able to do it as well. Any other questions for Sarah? Hi. Hi. Um, so you work for Amazon. I do. And uh, so how is your research for this presentation, the topic of reducing dimensionality of complex data, fit into the Amazon cloud service? Is sure. there any package or library that's available or open source? Um, so you'll notice I didn't put any of my title up there or my name. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that was on purpose. Um, I was reducing data dimensions there. See, unnecessary. Um, I'm the general manager for IoT analytics and applications, which means that my teams are building IoT analytics components. So we're building some of that into our ETL cross line. Uh, ETL is uh, one of the beginning parts. That's how you munge your data. It takes up 80% of the time, 90, 95, I don't know. Horses give me the yes. More than that in IoT. Um, so our teams are baking it into our products as a tool set that's available. Um, there are also uh, folks just kind of out in the world. It's, for me, this is in part to get information back from you to say, hey, Sarah, that's cute, the zero to three dimensions. That doesn't make any sense, though. Here's why. Um, you know, complexity doesn't scale that way. It's not useful for the underlying you know, technology explanations of how you move between those systems. Um, but yeah, so in general, these are getting baked into our, our product stack, and we deal with customers on a regular basis and trying to use this as a paradigm to help them get better quality uh, and the analysts out of their data. Cool. Well, thank you very yep. much, sir. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hands up. Should continue talking about IoT dimensions of systems. OK, a few. Um, hands up, never talk about this again, doesn't make any sense, and, <laughs> and there are better paradigms out there that are already exist, don't reinvent the wheel. Okay. <laughs> Very good, well, thank you, and if you did feel the way and didn't want to stick your hand up, come talk to me, would love the ideas. So, thanks, Ben. <laughs>